Faith and science, incompatible or inseparable? Did the church really slam dunk Galileo, or did he dunk himself? We'll answer these questions and more on this edition of Catholic Investigative Agency. It seems like some people, organizations, and governments are hell-bent on bringing down the Catholic Church. The question is, how do you expose opposition to the faith and to the truth? And while they say what you don't know can't hurt you, everybody needs to know about the hidden forces prowling around the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Guess that's where we come in. Follow me. Hello and welcome to this latest edition of CIA Catholic Investigative Agency. I'm Michael Voris. Have you ever considered the story of Galileo and his rocky relationship with the Catholic Church? The debate between science and religion is a relatively new one. It's only been discussed seriously since the time of Galileo. Well, in today's program, we're going to take a look at Galileo and making the case for faith and science. It's from this relationship a new war emerged pitting science against religion. This supposed war exists even today and hinders many souls from even considering Catholicism. You see, the popular thought is that the Catholic Church mistreated Galileo. People think he came up with a brilliant new scientific theory and the Church responded saying, no way, we can't let reason interfere with faith. Well, that's silly and untrue, and in this program, we're going to show you the real truth behind Galileo and the Catholic Church. So through his dealings with the Church, he set in motion this idea that science and religion are not compatible. Now, it's unclear if Galileo intentionally meant to do this, or if it was a byproduct of how the Church dealt with him. But whatever the case, Galileo's involvement with the Catholic Church is used more than any other example to show that any honest, intelligent man would be silly to believe that science and religion can live in harmony. They say, look, see how the Catholic Church made Galileo recant his scientific findings and how they put him under house arrest and how they tortured him in the most cruel ways and, ah, this is the reason science and religion cannot live in harmony because religion tries to suppress science at every turn and blah, blah. Yes, they say, I have figured it out. I am extraordinarily marvelous. Well, folks, we have to burst your bubble, but we're going to let you in on a little secret. All that garbage, I mean popular thought, all that garbage on most occasions has very little truth to it. Popular thought always seems to leave out all the important and game-changing details. How convenient. Isn't it funny that popular thought always takes the adverse position to the Catholic Church? But don't take my word for it. Let's go to the Man on the Street interviews we conducted and see just what people think about Galileo and the Catholic Church. What, what did the Catholic Church say or do in regard to Galileo? Well, I think they suppressed him or maybe they put him in uh, house arrest or something like that. I, they had a good documentary of him several times on PBS. It's fascinating. Yeah, this family came to his rescue on and off, if I remember right. Yeah, very interesting. He was one of the artists that uh, designed a whole lot of stuff. Okay. Um, Galileo of Galilee, and uh, isn't there a whole bunch of controversy ever since that book came out, the Da Vinci Code book? Wasn't that Galileo? Um, I, forgive me, my history is a little inac inaccurate, but uh, I believe that they, he was exiled um, for, you know, I don't know if he published something about it, but, you know, they, they were aware that he was doing things. Um, you know, unconventional and a little bit away from, but he, but he was sort of in good standing because he was, you know, at first, because he was, you know, a, a notable scientist and, and respectable, but, you know, he definitely was pushing the envelope a bit, and, you know, the authorities of the church were not too happy about it. I don't, I don't think they condemned him to death, um, but I know, it, I believe that he was exiled for, for the, you know, the last years of his life. Um, because of some of the actions he took that were, you know, not as uh, church friendly as um, as they would want. So. Uh, science repressed by religion. You know, his views were controversial. Didn't comport with what the church wanted to, you know, put out. 
and they persecuted him. I believe they kept him under house arrest for basically his life and suppressed the information and said it was uh, heretical. As you can see, we came across a range of opinions and understandings about the entire Galileo case. One main opinion resonated, the opinion that Galileo was persecuted unjustly. But as we can also see, the extent of popular thought was relatively shallow, as if these accusations were simply regurgitated. Galileo is a man bent on proving every, everyone wrong while he had very little evidence to back up his position. He refused to work with the church, and this is what caused his subsequent conflict. The Catholic Church simply wanted Galileo to prove heliocentrism, which is the idea that the planets revolve around the sun, but he couldn't prove it. It's important to know that the church has always supported many of the scientific endeavors of the world through church-sanctioned universities and various research institutions, for example. So let's examine the Galileo myth and uncover further what really happened. As with all CIA shows, we start with a thesis statement, and that thesis is, the true reason Galileo was tried for heresy is twofold. First, for his theological ideas, such as the meaning of scripture, and second, for his scientific findings, such as heliocentrism. So in order to understand Galileo better, let us begin with Galileo's early life and then later transition into the topics of science and the Catholic Church. Thunderbolt and lightning, very, very frightening me. Galileo, 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 Galileo Galileo Galilei was born in 1564. His first interest was the priesthood, but later he decided to study mathematics. In 1589, with his education, he was appointed chair of mathematics at the University of Pisa. A short time later, in 1592, when he was a young man, he got a job teaching math and science at the University of Padua until 1610, where he taught for the next 18 years. The focus of his life then turned fully to science. Through his observations, discoveries, and quarrels with the church, Galileo eventually became one of the most famous scientists who ever lived. The world and the scientific community see Galileo in many different lights. He's seen as one of the originators of scientific inquiry, at least in the early days. Today he is known as a champion of forbidden intellectual truths and thinking in a radical way. He's characterized as the first scientist to run the risk of complete ruin in the face of what he believed. Even some of the most influential and well-known scientists today have commented on the role Galileo has played in making modern science. Stephen Hawking, a well-known English theoretical physicist and cosmologist, said, Galileo probably bears more of the responsibility for the birth of modern science than anybody else. And then there is Albert Einstein, a theoretical physicist and the originator of the famous theory of relativity who called him the father of modern science. So the champions of modern day science obviously hold Galileo in high regard. But why is this? Well, his scientific career was quite successful. For example, he was able to improve drastically upon the telescope. These improvements made waves in the scientific community. As a cosmologist, Galileo broke new ground in the study of the universe. For instance, he was the first person to see sunspots, the moons of Jupiter, the phases of Venus, surface features on the moon, the rings of Saturn, and faint stars in the Milky Way galaxy. With these accumulating discoveries, the current standard of Aristotelian cosmology was soon to be challenged regarding the Earth as the center. Initially, many astronomers and philosophers refused to believe that anything was wrong with Aristotle's ideas. After all, Galileo was running headlong into unknown territory and trying to break a two millennial old tradition, and this didn't sit well with many people. Around this time, the church got involved because Galileo began encroaching upon matters of faith, and the church didn't like this. Not because they were out to rule the world, but because they wanted to ensure the faithful were only being fed genuine truth. This marks the first very public episode between the clash of science and religion in relation to the Catholic Church. So let's shift our attention to the actual case of Galileo now as it took place step by step. Thunderbolt and lightning, very, very frightening me. Galileo, 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 Galileo Picaro. Well, what you have to understand is Galileo wasn't the most humble scientist or Catholic. 
He was impressed with his discoveries, which led to an arrogance regarding church teaching and eventually arguing with the church about the meaning of the Bible. The Galileo case really begins with how Galileo reacted to his critics. The Galileo problem can be seen when you remove the lens that he was somehow an innocent victim who stood up for the truth and view him more realistically as a stiff-necked person who had a theory and nothing more. Galileo simply refused to be intellectually honest. He refused to admit that as far as he or anyone else could see, literally, for the time being, his theory was unprovable, even though he came very close to proving it. Galileo was an activist intent on getting his way, who repeatedly rejected offers of compromise. His personality wasn't the only issue he faced. He just so happened to be alive at a time when the church was in one of the more sensitive, challenging times in its history. They were tumultuous times. The Protestant revolt was in full ascent, actively tearing the church and nations apart across Europe. These two issues of Galileo's headstrong personality and the political religious turmoil of the time combined to create the perfect storm. The world was changing and the church wanted to make sure Galileo's theory wasn't going to go down the wrong path. This storm caught up with Galileo around 1610 when he published a book called The Starry Messenger. This marks the beginning of the Galileo case. It described many new discoveries Galileo had made. The book also raised a new interest in the theory of heliocentrism. Heliocentrism is the astronomical theory that the Earth and other planets revolve around the stationary Sun, which is at the center of the universe. However, at the time, most people, including the Church, believed in geocentrism, which is the idea of having the Earth as being the center of the universe. The big shift in public thought came when Galileo's telescopic observations were made known about Venus. Many educated people switched to a geo-heliocentric model of the universe during this time. Heliocentrism wasn't a new idea, having first been proposed as early as the 3rd century, 3rd century BC by Aristarchus of Samos. 1800 years later, during the Renaissance, around the year 1540, Copernicus developed, continued to develop the idea of heliocentrism and was published in 1543, but ultimately still could not prove that heliocentrism was true. About the same time, Galileo was creating his telescope. A fellow scientist, the astronomer Johannes Kepler, was trying to refine the heliocentric model. He did this by trying to prove it with calculations, but again, Kepler wasn't able to achieve such precision. Because neither Copernicus nor Kepler could prove heliocentrism completely via geometry or another mathematical method, the science world turned to Galileo and his vast improvements on the telescope. It's important to note that heliocentrism was rejected by many of the leading scientists of that day. Many scientists attacked Galileo's discoveries because it disagreed with Aristotle's model of the universe as well as several passages of scripture. Galileo disputed with many people, scientists and religious alike. His first dispute was with Christoph Scheiner, a prominent Jesuit priest, over the discovery of sunspots, which became a lifelong feud between the two of them. As we can see, he wasn't shy when talking about his peers or the prevailing ideas of the time. He called Johann Kepler's idea, the moon causes the tides, as a useless fiction. It's important to point out that even though he happened to be correct about heliocentrism, there were other things, such as Kepler's idea about the moon and tide relationship, that he was dead wrong about. Nothing was a given back in Galileo's day, even though it may appear obvious to modern man in present times. Galileo also refused to accept Kepler's elliptical orbits of the planets, believing instead the perfect shape of an orbit is a circle. It's of the utmost importance to note that the Catholic Church never officially rejected the idea of heliocentrism. They were actually neutral on physical matters in which little or no evidence existed, and yet Galileo was aware of this. He knew this. He's been quoted as saying, quote, I would say here something that was heard from an ecclesiastic of the most eminent degree, that the intention of the Holy Ghost is to teach us how one goes to heaven, not how the heavens go. That's a nice summation of how the church treats scientific theories right from the mouth of Galileo himself. Heliocentrism was freely discussed and often accepted in some Catholic circles. But when it came to the trial of Galileo, the Catholic judges upheld the scientific method, the scientific method, and said Galileo's theory had to be proven before he called it a fact. 
However, Galileo continued to insist that his theory was fact without the necessary proof to convince the scientific community and the church for that matter. Galileo's position roiled many both in the church and the scientific community. You must remember, Aristotle had rejected heliocentricity. Aristotelian thought was mostly the standard during Galileo's time. And back in that day, it was actually quite difficult to prove astronomical theories because technology had, had not advanced far enough. The highest charge against Galileo was the fact that he couldn't completely prove heliocentricity. He also failed to counter the very argument that had been made by Aristotle 2,000 years earlier. The argument being that if heliocentrism was true, we would be able to observe it by obvious shifts in the positions of the stars as the Earth moved around the Sun, also known as the stellar parallax. The stellar parallax wouldn't be confirmed until the 19th century with astronomer Friedrich Bessel's observations. A short time later, William Herschel would confirm that the Sun is not the center of the universe and by the 1920s, Edwin Hubble had shown that the solar system was part of a galaxy that was only one of many billions. Galileo, living in the 17th century, was a few centuries away from having the confirmation that he needed. It should be pointed out that believing the Earth was motionless in the 17th century was not absurd. The problem for Galileo was the development of technology, even with his personal advancements of the telescope. To validate his stance, he needed to show that the shift existed, the stellar parallax, but he was unable, even with geometry. He came close to proving his theory of heliocentrism through his telescopic confirmation of the phases of Venus, however. While he ultimately couldn't prove it, Galileo's discovery of the phases of Venus was his most influential contribution to the two-stage transition from full geocentrism to full heliocentrism via combined theory known as geo heliocentrism. At this point, he should have admitted defeat and moved on, but he didn't. He went on to say that heliocentrism was true without question, and there were a lot of questions still. The Catholic Church in this light was correct to disagree with Galileo. Canadian author and TV show host Michael Corrin, in his new book, Why Catholics Are Right, had this to say about the Church's position on science. The Church's claim is quite specific not to be an infallible source of wisdom or to know scientific truths long before they have been discovered, but to be the body and teaching office founded and left to us by Christ to communicate the gospel, spread the word of Christianity, and save sinners. That it provided and provides a culture and context for other secular truths to be propagated is a byproduct and not the essence of its existence. The science of Galileo's time was very limited and the most reasonable view was that the Earth was not moving at all because essentially no higher power telescopes existed. But that the Sun, Moon and stars were and at the best geoheliocentric model was the only provable theory. The reason heliocentrism was so controversial at the time was because it effectively reproposed man's place in the universe. Man, during Galileo's time, was thought to be extremely special, so much so that the entire universe, the entire universe, was physically ordered around him. To challenge this notion was almost unheard of because it meant man was a mere nothing in the eyes of the universe. Now, this didn't sit well with people. In fact, it shook their worldview. Although what the people of that time failed to realize is it doesn't take a physical place in the universe to be deemed special. It simply takes recognition of the mind that any place God so puts you is His will and is special in its own respect. No doubt, Galileo was an extraordinary individual, but he was treading on areas that challenged the relationship between science and religion and man's place in the universe, which caused the church to get involved. We need to realize that for the most part, Galileo was alone in his fight for heliocentrism. Galileo, a man of high intelligence, as it seems, could not prove it, although he did begin to move popular thought away from <laughs> geocentrism. It's also important to note that some of his colleagues even thought he failed in this endeavor. Galileo took this hard and alienated his fellow scientists by his insisting that his observations were in true, his constantly insisting that he was right, that they were fact, that they were established, and that any alternative was not only totally wrong, but the product of weak thinking and incompetent analysis. He, as it seems, wanted everyone to accept his theory immediately with no questions asked. The way he approached the entire situation turned off many people. 
To add to his problems, when the church got involved, he attacked those who were really trying to assist him in his pursuit of knowledge. In Michael Korn's recent book, here's what he said about the Galileo affair. Galileo got into trouble because he maintained that since the new discoveries seemed to contradict Scripture, those passages of Scripture should be reinterpreted in a metaphorical way. He did not seek to oppose the church, nor to doubt the inspiration of Scripture. The problem is that he abandoned science and started talking theology, and so attracted the notice of the Roman Inquisition. If he had left theology out of his writing and discussions, he would probably never have had problems. As the Galileo issue got bigger, various people within and outside the church responded to his comments. Some of the clergy, for example, argued from the position of the Bible. They said Psalm 93 verse 1, 96 verse 10, and 1 Chronicles 16.30 include the words, The world is firmly established, it cannot be moved. Also, Psalm 104 verse 5 says, The Lord set the earth on its foundations, it can never be moved. There's a problem, however, with taking a literal interpretation of the Bible. To explain this further, to a Catholic, the Bible is a central part of the faith and requires interpretation and is part but not all of the beliefs a Catholic holds. A Catholic does not always interpret the Bible in a strict, literal sense. To a Catholic, there are many senses of Scripture. Galileo claimed that heliocentrism was not contrary to Scripture. He took Augustine's position not to take every passage literally, particularly when the scripture in question is a book of poetry and songs, not a book of instructions or history. He believed that the writers of the scripture merely wrote from the perspective of the terrestrial world, from that vantage point that the sun does rise and set. Galileo claimed that science did not contradict scripture, as scripture was discussing a different kind of movement of the earth and not rotations. Given the state of the world at the time, however, Galileo became a flashpoint for the church. The church, on February 19, 1616, asked a commission of theologians, known as qualifiers, about the propositions of the heliocentric view of the universe. On February 24, 1616, about a week later, the qualifiers delivered their unanimous report condemning heliocentrism due to its lack of evidence and hard proof. The following day, February 25, 1616, Pope Paul V instructed Cardinal Robert Bellarmine, a Jesuit, a friend of science, an internationally respected theologian, scholar, and doctor of the church, to meet with Galileo and deliver the results of what the Inquisition or Commission of Theologians had decided on. Galileo was subsequently summoned on February 26, 1616, to Cardinal Bellarmine's residence and asked to accept the orders of the Inquisition prohibiting, condemning, or suspending various books which advocated the Copernican system. Galileo agreed to the orders, but still believed that he was right about heliocentrism. Cardinal Bellarmine even tried to reach a compromise with Galileo by issuing a document. The cardinal told his friend that he could not hold or argue the position, but could explore and discuss it. Cardinal Bellarmine was trying to allow Galileo enough wiggle room in the form of exploring and discussing heliocentrism to continue his work without officially supporting it. This clause remained in place until 1623, when Galileo approached the new pope and an old friend, Pope Urban VIII. Urban had always supported the investigation of the arts and scientific investigation. More to the point, he supported Galileo through his entire professional life. The pope wanted to help Galileo further by suggesting that he had approached this entire situation, should approach it carefully, and as a scholar, proposing the for and against arguments of the theory. Galileo took the advice of Pope Urban and published a book called Dialogue Concerning the Two Chief World Systems. This is where the real feud began. In writing the book, Galileo used Urban's position to play a fictional simpleton, making the Pope a figure of fun and mockery in the eyes of the academic world. The fictional simpleton was the defender of the Aristotelian geocentric view and was often caught in his own errors and sometimes came across as a fool. Indeed, although Galileo states in his book that the character is named after a famous Aristotelian philosopher, Simplicius in Latin and Simplicio in Italian, the name Simplicio in Italian also has the connotation of simpleton. Thus, the book was used to both attack the Pope and to advocate heliocentrism, 
which was an attack on the Aristotelian geocentrism and the defense of the Copernican theory. The Pope did not take this portrayal lightly, not to mention he was deeply hurt personally and felt betrayed by someone he had trusted and loved. But Galileo didn't stop with the Pope. He also attacked the Jesuits and their astronomers, who not to mention went to great lengths to write and speak in his defense. Galileo not only appeared to seek confrontation with the Pope, but all those around him who disagreed. At this time, he was ordered to stand trial on suspicion of heresy in 1633 for holding the following opinions. First, the sun lies motionless at the center of the universe. Second, the earth is not the center of the universe, but moves. And third, one may hold and defend an opinion as probable after it has been declared contrary to Holy Scripture. He was required to abjure, curse, and detest those opinions. Above all, the church wanted Galileo to prove heliocentrism was correct, but again, he couldn't. And so, this is why the church banned his book, The Dialogue, and put him under house arrest. Remember, Galileo was bent on trying to prove an unprovable theory, unprovable for his time, while arguing with the church about the meaning of the Bible and theology, so the church was forced to act. Galileo later recanted his opinions and ostensibly rejected heliocentrism publicly. There was no real torture in the case of Galileo. In fact, there wasn't any at all. He wasn't even treated badly. Ambassador Nicolini, the leading Tuscan diplomat in Rome, was a close friend of Galileo. Nicolini wrote extensively about the case. If he had a bias, he was against Rome and not Galileo. Nicolini sent regular reports to the court in relation to the Galileo case and reported to his king that, quote, the Pope told me that he had shown Galileo a favor never accorded to another, end quote, and that he has a servant at every convenience, end quote. The torture instruments were not used in Galileo's case, even though that was standard practice of the time. Furthermore, the Director for Inquisitors, a document published in 1595, prevented torture in such circumstances, and if the rules against torture were broken, those involved would be severely punished. Galileo's case received attention by the church because he declared a theory a fact and then argued with the church about the genuine meaning of the Bible. The church had no other alternative but to deal with Galileo directly. These dealings caused a sort of legacy to be left by Galileo that was skewed against the church. The legacy that religion tries to suppress science or that religion and science are not compatible. Because of this legacy, the debate between science and religion requires more explanation. Science and religion and the relationship between them have many serious modern implications, especially in relationship to the Catholic Church. So let's explore this relationship between science and the Catholic Church and answer some questions as to how the Church sought to advance science. Thunderbolts and lightning, very, very frightening me. Galileo, 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 Galileo The Church has a history of breeding scientific discovery from the earliest days all the way up to our present time. The Church could almost be characterized as more interested in scientific discoveries than some scientific agencies. As a matter of fact, it would be difficult, almost impossible, to find another religious organization that has done so much for the scientific world as the Catholic Church has. The earliest biblical prophecies attest to scientific endeavors as illustrated in the journey of the three wise men. From the Middle Ages, Augustine and Thomas Aquinas both argued that our ability to reason and to engage in empirical investigation is a gift from our Creator. More recently, Pope John Paul II issued an encyclical entitled Faith and Reason that reaffirmed the tradition of pursuing scientific investigation. He also gave many speeches to groups of scientists praising their work as a fulfillment of the human good. Pope Benedict has also been very outspoken about religion and science. If this wasn't enough, the Church has produced some amazing discoveries via their members. If the Church is so against the advancement of scientific discovery, then why has the Church, via its members, produced so many amazing and mind-blowing discoveries? Proof of this fact is abundant, as we shall now see. Here are a few examples of how Catholics have pushed the boundaries of scientific thought in the world through the use of their God-given intellectual abilities. Monsignor George Lemaitre was a Belgian priest and professor of physics. He studied cosmology and astrophysics. 
He proposed what became known as the Big Bang Theory. The Yugoslavian father, Roger Boscovich, was the founder of modern atomic theory. He went by many names, such as a theologian, physicist, astronomer, mathematician, philosopher, diplomat, poet, Jesuit, and a polymath. And he, of course, was a Catholic. Louis Pasteur, a French chemist and microbiologist, is remembered for his remarkable breakthroughs in the causes and preventions of diseases. He created the first vaccine for rabies and anthrax. He later invented pasteurization, and he was a Catholic. Roberto Landel de Mora invented the radio and developed the concepts of unity and physics forces and universal harmony. Father Mora was the first person to publicly demonstrate a radio broadcast. He accomplished this task on June 3, 1900. He was a priest and, of course, also a Catholic. Alexander Fleming was a Scottish biologist and pharmacologist. He wrote many articles on bacteriology, immunology, and chemotherapy. He was best known for his discovery of the enzyme lysozyme and the antibiotic substance penicillin. And he was a Catholic. Nicholas Copernicus was a Renaissance astronomer. He also proposed heliocentrism. He was involved in many fields, mathematics, astronomy, canon law, medicine, and economics. Copernicus was a priest and, of course, also a Catholic. Enrico Fermi was an Italian-American physicist. He was known for his work on the development of the first nuclear reactor and for his work on the development of quantum theory, nuclear and particle physics, and statistical mechanics. He was a Catholic. The father of modern Egyptology was Father Athanasius Kircher. He published around 40 works, the most notably being in the areas of Oriental Studies, Geology and Medicine. He's been compared to fellow Jesuit Roger Boscovich and to Leonardo da Vinci for his vast range of interests. He was Catholic. Madame Marie Curie was known for her work in radioactivity. Madame Curie worked in the physics and chemistry fields. She is the only person to receive a Nobel Prize in two different sciences, and she was a Catholic. And Agostino Salambrino, a Jesuit brother who lived in Lima, Peru, observed the local Indian Quechua tribe using the bark of a local tree, and subsequently he developed the first cure for malaria. The medicine was then exported back to Europe and Rome and became known as Jesuit's bark. The list goes on and on. The contribution that the Catholic Church and her members have made to science is enormous. An entire series could be written on this very topic. So it's silly in light of this evidence to think that the Catholic Church is somehow opposed to the advancement of scientific discovery. In fact, a very strong argument can be made that the Church is the force behind the advancement of science, at least in the early days. So society owes a large debt of gratitude to the Catholic Church because of what its members have accomplished. There isn't any doubt now that Galileo was on to something revolutionary and sort of off the beaten path. After all, he effectively reproposed a whole new outlook on the existence of man and man's place in the universe. Although he wasn't the first scientist to propose the theory, he was the first to have some tangible proof thanks to his telescopic advancements. So we must remember that anytime the truth is challenged, people are going to have issue with it and resist. We see this time and time again throughout human history. The resistance to this new thinking was largely justified on the church's part because in order for a new theory to be accepted, all arguments against it must be dispelled and if research is connected to it, it must be both reliable and valid. There's great importance in being able to find very similar results. This scientific method is how all scientists approach empirical investigation regardless of their religious convictions. If other researchers cannot replicate or duplicate the findings, the study or the experiment is said to be effectively worthless. Confirmation in the scientific world is of the utmost importance. The church cares about science and the advancement thereof. The only logical conclusion, therefore, is that science and the Catholic Church can and do live in harmony for the betterment of both fields. Now that we have seen how the church has advanced science and continues to do so, Let's move to refuse, rejoin science and religion in a harmonious relationship in our final word. Thunderbolts and lightning, very, very frightening me. Galileo, 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 Galileo Magnifico. 
The Galileo case, and to a further extent, the clash between religion and science, is a cause of sadness. What the Galileo case reveals is the imperfection of its members and relatively little about science and the church's attitudes toward it. If we really want to find evidence of an ideology controlling and oppressing science, let's look at the great atheistic regimes of the 20th century. For example, Stalin told his scientists to lie about their discoveries to the point where they in turn lied to him and as a result enacted government policies based on fraudulent research. The cultist Hitler had an obsession with using science to pervert truth and his theories on eugenics, social engineering, and racial health. President Obama has also twisted science to promote his own agenda, with his Department of Health and Human Services mandating that all health insurances cover contraception and sterilization. That department says that scientific studies show that greater use of contraception within the population produces lower unintended pregnancy and abortion rates nationally. However, they only used two studies to back up their new mandate, one of which was from a very biased source. Numerous studies actually show that increased use of contraception does not lower unintended pregnancy and abortion rates. The list goes on and on, of course, but we think you get the point. The argument that Galileo is correct to stand against the church in the name of science is ridiculous and superficial. Those who hold that Galileo is correct all around are seriously misled. As we've shown, Galileo is actually at fault for many of his problems, and the church is merely reacting to a potentially bigger problem down the road. Considering the Protestant revolt, the church was almost forced to act in some official way. Galileo refused to listen to anyone but himself, and that was the problem. He was seemingly a very wise man, but lacked humility when it came to scientific ventures. He also was fighting for an unprovable notion that the earth is not the center of the universe. Many centuries would go by before the church would speak in any official way about Galileo. In 1989, under Pope John Paul II, the church officially cleared the name of Galileo of any wrongdoing. The pope discussed the mistakes the church had made and apologized for how the church handled the case, but reaffirmed that the church was correct for asking Galileo to prove his theory. Pope John Paul II went on to say that the province of the church is theology and revelation, not science or astronomy. Pope Urban had less understanding of the world during the 16th century than we do in the 21st century, and this, therefore, caused him to reject the theory of heliocentrism, which is the idea that the planets revolve around the sun, which we now know today is correct. If the pope knew heliocentrism was true, he would have agreed with Galileo, but there was no way to prove it. The Pope was not acting in his capacity of teacher when deciding if Galileo was right or wrong, but in the characterization of prudent guardian. This means that the Pope was in no way violating the doctrine of papal infallibility as some people like to claim. Science and religion will always be topics of hot debate because society at large doesn't understand that the two can live in harmony, or maybe society just doesn't want to understand that. Through the use of the Galileo case, this program aims at showing that they can live in harmony, while showing that the church was indeed correct in taking a stance of opposition to Galileo given the scientific technology of the day. Science and religion can and do live in harmony, and we, and we know scientific truths point to God. So now, let's give you some important takeaway points we've been dealing with here in these relational topics, the church and Galileo, and science and religion. The Catholic Church was justified in how they dealt with Galileo due to various factors that were apparent during that era. First, Galileo's theory, heliocentrism, was not provable during that time because no high-power telescopes existed. Second, Galileo was treading on areas of theology and the meaning of scripture and not focusing on science. He was arguing with the church about how the Bible should be interpreted. Third, a concern for the advancement of science really starts and ends with or even flows out of a grace-filled life. The great accomplishments as put forth by Catholic scientists throughout the centuries is a testament to this fact. Fourth, this concern carries on to the present day with encouragement from all the recent popes that science is important and necessary because it helps man contemplate God through the beauty of his creation. Fifth, even today, the Church uses scientific and empirical investigation to determine the veracity of a miracle. Sixth, 
Science and religion in no way contradict each other. They are both concerned with the discovery of truth, which always leads to God. So the next time you find yourself in a conversation that brings up Galileo, the Catholic Church, and science, you'll have the knowledge to slay the dragons of error and confusion along the way. So now you know. Thanks for watching this edition of CIA, Catholic Investigative Agency. I'm Michael Voris. Let's hit the streets.